So welcome everyone. This is the Sigma Tau Delta event at the University of the District of Columbia. And today we welcome Sammy Miranda. Welcome, Sammy. Hey, how's it going? Can everybody hear me okay? All right. All right, cool. Well, I'm I'm Sammy Miranda. I'm going to start, I think, maybe with just reading a couple of poems um, and then go into showing a few images of the work. And then I'm also doing video work at this point where I'm taking some of my poems and working with a filmmaker, Ellie Walton, to create um, video poems. So I'll show an example of that as well. Um, but I'll start with a poem um, called Street Full of Greetings. So gentrification is an issue that's happening like fully in DC. Um, and I think one of the signs that that's occurring is when you're sitting on your porch and you say hello and people just kind of walk past, right? Because um, at one point, most of the folks who were in your neighborhood you knew or interacted with in some way. Street full of greetings. Hello, good morning. Y que panita, how you? What's happening? Que onda wey? I'm gonna kick your ass. Me debes, papuasipote. How you and the family doing? Good morning. Hello. 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 When a street full of greetings gets invaded by silence, we think about fear, about how brown skin houses tongues made mute by the arrival of ears deafened by a hello, tossed from a front porch and translated into a threat. We think about migration and how it brought us here, how we traveled away from war, from poverty, from beauty and family, and came to streets where our strangeness made us unwelcome. How we fought so that our bodies could walk where they wanted to, so that our dark skin would be the color of belonging, where the sounds of our tongues let loose would not signal a beatdown, where the music we made could scream from our windows and cars and the neighbors different, but the same could recognize themselves in the notes. When a street full of greetings is invaded by silence, we think about change and how it tries to usher us away and how we root our feet into cement and scream, hello, from our front porches, because this is home and we will not be invisible. Let's see, a lot of my work also is work that's in conversation with other artists, with visual artists in particular. Um, so I'm gonna, pick a piece that kind of does that. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm looking for the piece. Actually, you know what, we'll go, we'll go somewhere else. So, one of the other things I've been doing lately is as I'm getting older, I'm starting to reflect on like my previous selves. Um, and as, as you get older, you find that who you were at different stages in your life is not who you are currently. It helped make you, it helped like define who you were, but it didn't, it's not you anymore. So I did a series of self portraits and uh, this is self-portraits in Lee jeans and suede pumas. And at this point, this is high school. I was a quiet, quiet kid who just kind of roamed um, by himself. Um, and the thing I loved to do most was ride the New York subway. Um, there is nothing to see here, nothing out of the ordinary, 
just another passenger on the downtown bound five train, looking for silence in the rumbling of train, track, and tunnel. Searching for anonymity in rush hour crowds, cassette bought and dropped into Walkman, soundtrack sampled. And actually, this is, I think what I'll do, what I'll do at this point is I'll, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna show you a poem that was done, a video poem that was done with uh, filmmaker Ellie Walton. We collaborated to create a series of these and this is one of them. do that. You're not able to see the video. Um, Sammy, you're sharing the screen, but not the video. Okay, let me see if I can get it right then. Screen. Oh, this one. There it goes. Sound. There we go. Can you see it now? Yes. looking for my citizenship. When I am unsure of who I am, I pick up my dominoes and search out a reverendo Pedro Pietri so we can pray for clarity. I find him in front of the botanica. We slam the bones onto a card table, become domino table, become seat of divination. He fingers a double zero y canta la boringueña. If you can't fly, swim to the Spirit Republic of Puerto Rico, he tells me. So I wait in line at the Puerto Rican passport agency, listening to the click clack of the monja who types my identity into a dream I have every madrugada. Where you headed, my friends ask, a state of mind, where plena always comes to my rescue. Banging out the news from El Barrio, or Loisaida, or El Bronx. All places I run to, then from, then back to again. Borderless. So have a couple of pieces that I've worked on that are also, um, they're, they're collage poems. So they were cut out of National Geographic magazines, right? Um, so all of the, ev all the words, all the phrases have come from a different space. Um, and then they were recompiled to make the piece or the pieces that um, you'll hear. So this piece is called Protection from Predators. 
and it's composed from National Geographic magazines from the 1950s. A young man asks his father why Blacks born in the United States feel unwelcome. Ask one of the Americans who survived. Oh Lord, won't you buy me protection from predators, armor against decay. Listen, this is tough to admit. Time has not eased the grief of a woman whose son died. Prayer softens hard times for families. I would like to think that, but no. One day I called on Nina. She still smelled of charred flesh, raising a hymn on Sunday, barbed but beautiful. This song should only be sung by its owners. And then I'll read one other piece that was actually in response to um to a song by Sonora Santanera. Um, and the song goes, En un bote de vela a la mar me tiro, que me lleve el viento muy lejos contigo. In a little sailboat, I'll, I'll head out to sea, let the wind take me um, far away with you. Um, and it became, it's a piece that's included in an anthology that a Boca Floja Mexican hip hop artist um, curated. We came to this at times driven into the smell of salt water by the sting of whip and the bonds of chains. At times escaping into the smell of salt water when need combined with the myth of better made it necessary. Wind against sail and wave against wood, now making decisions our feet once made, taking us farther than the roads that are calloused, bare feet, that calloused our bare feet and wore away at the soles of our shoes ever did. Sometimes we rode the ocean, sing rumbo fijo, like mangrove seedlings, flat and fast, turning vertical only when we found ourselves in brackish water knowing here was where our roots would need to take hold. Strong currents brought us here, and this will become home now, a place where floating is a natural state of things until our feet find their footing or sink into sand too soft to hold our weight. We have not come here alone. We bring ancestors who have passed down the medicine of memory. We know roots that drink from fresh water. We are Seba, anchored on earth but touching sky. We are also mangrove, growing where land and water meet, bearing the brunt of ocean-born storms and hurricanes, finding breath where most would drown. Um, I guess I can also um, show a couple of pieces of work. Um, I've been doing a lot of work um, in different media. So some of it has been embroidery, some is carving, painting. Um, I do some drawing and some installation work. Um, I'll show a couple of pieces that are um, that are embroidered pieces, and then I'll show a couple of other works that. Up. And so, and most of my work is figurative. So it's work that always looks at people, right? 
Um, actually. This, for example, is a piece that was hanging in the show that I just did. Um, and every person, and it's an embroidered piece. So these pieces are all sewn. Um, they're sewn portraits. And there are artists and poets and musicians who are either native Washingtonians or who have lived in DC and made work in DC for many years. So this is Naomi Ayala, she's a poet. Um, Deepak Ram, who's a uh, bamboo flute player, Bansuri flute. Lisa Pegram, who's a poet. Ellie Walton, who is a filmmaker. Um, Kenny Carroll, who is a poet in DC. Lucy Murphy, who's a singer and activist. Um, Frank Rosario, who's a visual artist. Pepe Gonzalez, who's a bass player. And Marta Perez Garcia, who is um, an, a visual artist who actually has some work up at the Phillips right now. Um, so if you get a chance, you should check her work out there. Um, this is another embroidered piece that's also kind of like a, a mixed media piece. Um, it is a portrait of an artist that I met in Madrid. The other thing I do a lot is I collaborate with artists. So this piece here is actually a collaboration. Um, so the screen print work that's up, the black and yellow and blue is by, an, by the guy who's embroidered on it. He's a Chilean artist who lives in Madrid, who's been working in Madrid for a while. Um, and the composition is mine, as is the embroidery. But this piece here, that is the, the screen print, because he's a screen printer, is his. Um, let's see. Then, so, I've also done pieces that are more installation pieces. So for example, and that come off the work that my grandfather, or, or the stuff that my grandfather left behind, right? Um, so this is an installation piece that is a portrait with objects around it. Um, and the photo was actually a photo that my grandfather took in the 19, early 1950s um, in New York at a house party um, for the Puerto Ricans. Um, but, and the objects are meant to tell the story of the young man who's painted there. Um, this one is actually um, inspired by my grandmother, who's the woman in the portrait. Um, she was a nurse in Puerto Rico, but when she came to New York, the work she could get was, in, was sewing in a factory, um, like many Puerto Rican women at the time. Um, so that particular portrait is meant to show that the effect of migration on the choices that people had, right? Um, and then this piece is, again, another photo that my grandfather took in the 50s in New York, um, a painting of one of my mother's cousins. And actually a version of this is what's in the um, Molina Family Gallery at the American History Museum, this box, but with other objects. Um, and this is, meant to show the kinds of things we brought with us um, as we traveled, right? Often we bring not just physical things, but we bring our history, we bring our religion, we bring our, you know, belief systems, right? Um, and then, let's see. And then there are paintings. Um, uh, many of the paintings that I've been, are, most of my work is figurative, but the, some of the paintings are built around Pepe Gonzalez, who's a bass player that I perform with, and his photos from um, 
the seventies in Mount Pleasant, right? Um, so he's like definitely someone, this is him actually right here. Um, this is also him. These are screen printed and then this is painted, but this is his crew of folks from like the 1970s. He was in a band called Zapata. Um, and we actually, uh, Ellie Walton and I have just done a series of short films about Pepe Gonzalez um, because he's contributed a lot to music in DC, to jazz in DC, and just as a, a container of history, right? Um, and there's a saying in Spanish, dale la flore antes que se muera, you know, give them their flowers before they die, right? So, you know, we got to make sure we acknowledge folks who are contributing to the communities we grow up in. And that's one of the reasons I make art, right? To acknowledge those folks. Um, anyway, I think maybe I'll stop there and like, open it up for questions. Um, and then if you want to hear another poem or two after that, I'm happy to share that. Well, thank you. This is fantastic because I can see the how students in English and then also students taking art classes can really uh, learn a lot from your work. So does anyone have any questions uh, about his uh, poetry, about his uh, visual uh, art? And you can put the questions in the chat and we can also read them from the chat if you want. Um, so I see that Ellie Walton is here. Um, so I would like to hear, so I guess my first question is to, if you can both of you talk a little bit about the collaboration because it's, it's also the, the documentary film on Plesa, but also I didn't see, I haven't seen that video before. The one that you showed uh, with the dominoes talking about Pedro Pietri and I got really, <laughs> excited because you know Pedro Piedri uh and the Puerto Rican passport um mm -hmm. and the manifesto instead of the passport is such a fantastic idea so I I guess I have two questions one is if you can talk more about the influence of Pedro Piedri in the particular piece uh and also the making of the video with Ellie Weldon okay um I think for me the the P Pedro Pietri is like and with Puerto Rican obituary, he wrote stuff that as a Puerto Rican um, who grew up in New York City, you know, I was able to connect with, right? Um, and like, I mean, just reading his stuff, like put me in a, in a space where I was thinking about things that I hadn't thought about in a while, right? Um, and really that I didn't think about because I was just coming up in the stuff, right? Um, but, I mean, Pietri also like collaborated with a uh, artist, Aral, which is that poem is actually in response to a piece by Aral, right? Um, and both of them are like no longer with us, right? Um, so it's always, again, it's always nice to give an homage to folks who've like influenced you in whatever way that was. Um, and then, I mean, I collaborate a lot with folks. And so I met Ellie Walton through um, La Mamplesa, which is a film about the uprisings that happened in Mount Pleasant in 1991. Um, it's an important film, I think. It's a film that like makes a statement about things we need to remember and why we need to remember them. Um, if you get a chance to see it, definitely take that chance. It's worth it. Um, and then when we we were doing that work, um, a lot of the work that I included in the film was poetry, along with like conversations. Um, but I think what ends up happening is that we start a conversation about other possible collaborations. Because um, again, that's my that's my MO. I collaborate with other artists. Um, I have paintings where I did half the painting and another artist did the bottom half, right? Um, so because I think what that does, that collaboration is it pushes you into spaces that you might not have been comfortable in, right? That you 
um, that push your your work to another place, to another level in many ways. And I think I'm my work is visual because I'm a visual artist, but to work with someone who then like puts a visual to that like idea, right? Also helps me see how my own poetry can create a particular image, right? So we've been doing some of that work and then, um, then we also worked on a, we got a grant to do the movies about Pepe. And again, it's like, I've written a whole body of work about Pepe Gonzalez, the bass player and his stories and his life. And, you know, so it's only like, right that at some point we let him tell his story, right? So we took, interviews with Pepe and we added poems and music, right? Um, to then help him narrate the story of his contributions to jazz, of his mentors, of life coming up in Mount Pleasant, things like that. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions? There's a question in the chat by Claudia Diaz. Um, says beautiful poems and visual arts. I mean, my questions are, how did you get into poetry? Did you have support from your family to be a poet artist? And what, who inspired or inspires you? Um, so I was looking back through my yearbook, high school yearbook, and there was a page in the yearbook that I had forgotten about that was poems by me with a picture of me in a denim jacket and a mullet, right? Um, but it's like, at that point, I was not a poet. I did not consider myself a poet. I was like a kid who wanted to get out the Bronx for a while and see what else was there. Um, I got into poetry, really got into poetry when I started teaching high school. So, I had been teaching already for about four years, but I had been teaching little kids. Like I was, the year before I started teaching high school, I was teaching pre-kindergartners and kindergartners. And then I went to ninth grade and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, so I was like, well, I'm gonna teach them poetry because I like poetry and what the hell, why not, right? Um, and this was at Bell in 1996. So, I get into the classroom and I start telling teacher, I start telling the kids, yo, you gotta write and you're gonna, and they're looking at me like, oh, hell nah. It's like, if you ain't writing, we ain't writing. It's like, you can't tell us to do something you ain't doing. Um, so I started writing with them. And then I was like, oh, you guys gotta go like share this stuff out. And like, you know, this is wonderful writing that you're doing. So we took them to an open mic at Mangoes on U Street. And there were 20 of us kids and teachers. And the Tony Asante Lightfoot, who was running that open mic at the time, comes over to our table and she's like, oh, great, you all are going to read. And all those like ninth graders turned and looked at me and they were like, and I was like, oh, OK, OK. If I do this, every single one of you has to do it too, you know? And this was the first time I've ever, I've ever read in public. You gotta remember, like I present as an extrovert, but I am an introvert. Um, so I'm shaking, I'm like gagging. I can't even drink water, right? But all of us read. And the beauty of it was that when those kids came off the mic and sat back at the table, the poets who were there prior, who like were regulars at the open mic and who also workshop poems together, came up to the kids after and talked to them, not as kids who had come to an open mic, but as poets who had just shared their work, right? So the minute I saw that happening, I was like, oh, I wanna be a part of that. I wanna like, this is, this is community, you know? Um, and I think 
that's where I got a lot of my support from. It's like DC's poetry community is a beautiful thing, right? Um, it's it's a group of folks who really support each other. Um, like every Saturday, I get together with Ruben Jackson at the American Poetry Museum, and Ruben Jackson is at UDC. He's like he's a jazz um, archivist at UDC. Um, if you ever get a chance to like check him out and have a conversation, he's full of history as well, right? Um, and I think in terms of like family, I mean, my family was like, do you, you know? And I was like, I never try to make my living as an artist. I've, I, I always tell folks, I practice three um, art forms and the first is teaching. Um, so I make my living from that. I teach. I'm a teacher, right? Um, and I'm a poet and I'm a visual artist, right? Um, so at this point, it's like, you know, my family was was supportive, always has been um, around like poetry and art. Um, my child is a singer. So, you know, I think some of that passed down a little bit in a different form. Um, and really the folks who inspire me are those kids and the kids that I teach now, because they come up with beautiful, beautiful work. And every time I read it, I'm just like reminded that they're better than me, you know? And that I got a lot to learn from them. So, you know, I, I just like, they inspire me, you know? to keep writing, to keep doing the work, to keep sharing it, you know? Thanks for the question, Claudia. Thank you, I have to agree that that's also how I got started with the, you know, because there's a strong community of writers in this mm -hmm. strong poetry community. And I also got started with open mics, thanks to Naomi Ayala. If it wasn't for Naomi Ayala, who mm -hmm. I was a student who told me to get on the open mic in Mount Pleasant Library, I wouldn't be writing anything. So it is, it is, you have to be involved. So that's why I have open mics here with all the events so that people get encouraged, you know? So hopefully we'll see if anyone's reading. Usually we have people reading. Um, and today, because it's an art, we also talk about art. If in the open mic, anyone wants to share a drawing or a painting, that that's also cool. So uh, does anyone have any other questions? Um, actually, I, um, actually, I do, um, I have been trying to figure out how to somehow get my father's work published. My father is not a professor. He's not a teacher. He is all of, he'll be 83 this year. And he is like a lot of black men who um, were born during the silent generation. He was born in 39. In Canada, uh, I think you're cutting in and out. Oh, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll make it quick. My father wrote his autobiography as a result of going to therapy. And what he had to say says a lot about what it means to be black and brown. My father is your color, by the way. He's your color with hazel eyes. Mm. He grew up during a time in which if you were red bone or light skin or high, high yellow um, and poor, you were not going to be treated very well. And so the first time I took him to a Dominican restaurant, these uh, folks started talking to him in Spanish because they assumed that he was Dominican. So he gets a lot of that treatment as well. And so he writes about what it, about all of these things. And I am at a loss as to how to get his voice, get his work out there. He actually wrote his autobiography as therapy, mm -hmm. um, which tells you about the beauty of what it means to live in the 21st century is that would not have happened 
um, in the previous century. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Just anything, because I'm, I'm, you know, um, he and I have decided that we're definitely doing a podcast, but a podcast ain't enough. He wants other people, other black men and black and brown men to read what he had to say, because he came from, he came from the inner city of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. I'm not from here. I'm from, you know, and so, you know, he came up during a time in which it was still segregated. Right. Just any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I think, I think the podcast idea is, is a really good one. Cause I think you're going to have a larger reach even than if you're trying to publish it in print. Right. Um, also self-publishing options are always present. Um, like, you know, just putting it out, you know, getting it done yourself. Um, and then, I mean, I think the other piece, if it's, if it's not poetry, if it's prose, then using a digital format to do that, um, to get it out, to like have it available to people. Um, it's like, if, it, if the point is just to get the story out, um, I think like having a digital option um, and you'd have to like research like what those possibilities are and having the podcast where he's reading from that work and then maybe others are responding to it would be a beautiful thing. And I think that's, that really is, I think, because the, the reading, like some folks will get, but if you can get a larger number of folks to kind of like listen to the podcast, I think that might be even be your better bet. I think that is, I think that is the, is the is the thing thank you for your insight and may i also say that um as i do have a podcast show um i would love to have you on board so my name is sherry ann turpin i'm an associate professor here um and you know i you know i i usually usually uh, talk about um exactly about exactly what you and your and your folk talk about and so i'm a graduate of udc peace all right, all right now all right and i'll share a link to my podcast in the cool. chat and ava has my information so feel free to ask her for it all right peace brother okay. same same thank you all for the questions are there any other questions So you answered a question about when you got into writing, but I want to know when you got into the um, producing art, because when I met you, I honestly didn't know that you were also a visual artist. And it wasn't until mm -hmm. years later that you started sharing on social media. So was it, uh, were you an artist before a poet? Were you always both at the same time? Uh, I just want to know personally. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I actually majored in fine arts in, college. Um, I went to Georgetown and majored in something you don't major at in Georgetown, at least not when I was there. Um, so I double majored. I majored in English and in fine arts, studio arts. Um, so I started there. Um, I always tell people I spent four years at university drawing naked people and reading books. Um, I can't, like, you know, what else, did, what else could you ask for? Um, but I think what happened was that when I got into teaching, that became like the thing I focused on. So for the most part, I wasn't a practicing artist at that point. Um, and then in 2007, I left school-based work. And that same year, I got all the stuff that my grandfather left after he passed. Um, and I had already started doing poetry at that point, because I started poetry in 96. Um, but in 07, because I was no longer in a full-time like gig, um, I started taking my grandfather's images and letters and objects that he left behind and creating work from that. Um, and I started painting. 
um, which is not so, because I mean, I my focus in college was drawing, um, but I just started painting and started creating these large scale paintings, like four, four foot by four foot paintings based on the images that my grandfather had left behind because he left hundreds and hundreds of like negatives and photos that we'd never seen because he kept them all in closets. He never took any of that stuff out, right? So he just kind of like, because he didn't, I asked him one time, Abuelo, tell me a story um, about like, you know, coming up, about you being, you know, in the army, about what, any of that. He's like, for what? It's not important, you know? Um, so like, I think once I, cause I really, I was really connected to my grandfather. So once he passed and I got his stuff, I think it just opened up this like desire to like give that story the importance that he didn't feel it had. Um, and I, I started painting and I haven't stopped since. And I try to like add new things to my repertoire because I want to learn them. Um, so now, I, like I said, I tell people I have three jobs and three art forms that I practice. And none of them are less than any other. I make my money from teaching, um, but like the other two are professions that I like really take time to learn the craft for and hone the craft for. Thank you so much. So I guess if there are no more questions, I don't see anything in the chat. Uh, we're kind of open for the open mic, so I'm going to start recording.